Podcasts is brought to you by FMC Preschool, The Soybean School, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Hello, all, and welcome to this episode of The Agronomists. Uh, sorry, we seem to have a little bit of a hiccup with the title and the uh, link happening on YouTube and uh, Twitter. So uh, if you're here, yay. This is the uh, residue management uh, ahead of soybeans discussion. You are not in the wrong place. Uh, we'll get that sorted out, I'm sure. It is also episode 99. We shall call it The Great One. Okay, uh, next week, our 100th episode, we're throwing a huge party and we're talking about flea beetles. So there you go. All right, uh, evening all. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, if you collect those CEU credits, of course, tonight's broadcast does qualify for those. So please just make sure to head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. Let us know you took in the episode and get those credits. Um, yes, Warren Schneckenberger, we shall have balloons next week and in each of them shall be flea beetles. And when you pop the balloons, they just spread everywhere. No, I don't think so. Also, uh, hello to Aman out in Pakistan, uh, Jason in Manitoba as well, and of course, Warren here in Eastern Ontario. Um, let's bring in our guest. I feel like I'm forgetting something already, but I am super excited for this episode. We've got some great slides to look at, some wonderful visuals. We've got some great clips. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we are going to talk residue management. And of course, in Ontario, there's only one name that we can actually have on the show for such a topic, and that's Horace Bonner. And joining me for the first time on the show, I'm very excited about this, is Dr. Yvonne Lawley from the University of Manitoba. Now, Yvonne, do you remember that we happened to be in university at the same time? You probably don't remember, but I remember. So there you go. Uh, anyway, Horace, how are you tonight? I'm well, yeah, thanks for the invite. All right. Okay. So um, I don't even know where to start. Okay. Actually, I do. Horst, let's start with uh, last year was an interesting one uh, here in Ontario. Uh, there were areas of extreme drought and then, of course, some areas that did incredibly well. Um, what do you think coming off 2022? Biggest lesson for soybeans? Well, I mean, one thing that comes to mind immediately is that we often just underestimate the ability of some of the new genetics, right? I mean, we had some pretty tough dry conditions. And at the end of the day, we still had a 49 prov provincial average, 49 bushels an acre, which is our five-year average. And if you think back 20 years or so, our five-year average was about 37 bushels. And to be honest, I remember having a conversation, you know, we had these these talks within the ministry and, and in terms of crop insurance and, you know, all kinds of concern. Are we going to have a big payout? And and uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we pulled off an average average yield, which was pretty exciting. And so I, I think the big thing now is, of course, the strange winter that we're having in terms of these yeah. warm temperatures and then and then cold again. How how's that going to impact next year's next year's soil conditions, right? So I will share, Horst, that right now um, I would have agreed with you until about a week ago, in which now we are fully into a regular Ottawa winter. But uh, I was pumping water out of my basement on New Year's Day. So yes, it's been weird. So there you go. All right. Now, Yvonne, a, a different story in Manitoba, probably one of the most challenging seasons in a really long time in 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, but a record, was it officially a record soybean yield reached in the province last year? I think it was. Yeah, no, we had a real pleasant surprise, I think. The moisture that came was right in time to fill soybean pods. And so after two really disappointing seasons, maybe even more depending on what area you're from, uh, soybeans really came back this year. And uh, I think it's a great time to be thinking about residue management because we've been through these extremes in Manitoba of extreme dry. And uh, in certain periods of the year, we've had some real moisture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jason shares here, new, um, you've got, uh, it was a new record of 44.5 bushels mm -hmm. in 2022, which is 2.4 bushels higher, which is phenomenal. Um, 
Okay, so, oh, I'll send, thank you, Kevin. It says you have a link that people are waiting on but are playing here instead. Uh, I'm guessing that's on YouTube. Yeah, we're having a bit of a hiccup with Restream. So, uh, Producer Jay, um, I'm not sure if you can uh, do anything about it. We're going to try um, and we'll see if we can get everybody on the live stream here. Um, but, uh, Kevin, if, if you do have any friends that are watching or trying to watch, let them know that we're over here, wherever here is, somewhere on the internet. Um, all right. Okay, so, Yvonne, you bring up a really good point in that we are going to focus on residue ahead of soybeans. So, so the ground that soybeans are going into this spring. Um, and last, so that to me, of course, always starts in the fall before, and that depends on, so whether that's a fertility pass, whether that's a, that's a tillage pass, whatever it is, um, I'm thinking about residue from the fall before. So if, if memory serves me, Manitoba turned quite wet, did it not at harvest last year? Or how did, or shortly after harvest did it because that last year was just ridiculous so what challenges might this spring be hiding under the snow for manitoba growers i think it depends a little bit sort of how moisture deficient you were at the end of the season um we've got lots of snow here in most parts of manitoba this year so I think we've got good chance of a full recharge this winter, which is really promising. So we, you know, we go back and forth in Manitoba between not wanting any residue to slow down spring planting in the springtime when it's wet and cold to needing residue when it gets really hot in August, especially with soybeans. And so we go back and forth between wanting to get rid of that moisture in the springtime and needing to conserve that moisture later on in the season. Mm -hmm. Horace, does that sound different than Ontario? Because I feel like we should be having very different conversations, but that to me sounds quite similar in Ontario. We almost, we almost want a drought in April, don't we? Oh, yeah, no, there's no question. And the main problem in Ontario in the spring is the fact that the ground is too wet, right? And so sometimes, of course, what happens is you've got one nice snow-till window right in april right and the ground is actually sometimes the best as it comes out of winter and you get that first dry dry opportunity and no-till and that's why you've got some growers that push for that super early right that first window in april you just plant but i think what's different from what i just heard about the west is that in august certainly you know uh, or in the summertime of course um, we don't think about residue in terms of uh, holding in moisture. Um, we're, we're just, uh, we live on rainfall really when it comes to mid season, like uh, the, the residue doesn't really impact us as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I think we can still order rain in August though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> enough, can we do enough. that? I think, I think it'll work no, no matter what. All right. All right. So John, uh, Ray, thanks for letting us know. Yes, this is not a winter wheat episode. The number and the name is wrong. Uh, we're not quite sure why there was an upgrade to the platform that we're on. Um, so there we go. All right. Uh, but thank you for being here. Nonetheless, um, Dr. Dave Hooker with our first question. Oh, this is a good one. All right. And actually last year for Manitoba anyway, is an interesting question, but Horst, you mentioned that window in April at times. So definitively, should soybeans be planted before corn? Oh, Dave, what kind of a question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right? Dave's hilarious. Yeah. Of course, Dave and I are doing a nice Horst. project um, on that. And we've got a couple of years of data now. And uh, so far, it looks very much like both corn and soybeans respond in a similar fashion. In other words, they both start to lose yield as you as you delay delay planting, but there's not a huge advantage to planting super early for soybeans. So the way I would kind of answer the question is both should be planted in a very timely window. And if you can plant your soybeans really early, uh, you, you really need to marry that with the concept of a full season bean. And, and having said that, you know, with those two ideas together, um, and because soybeans are a little less um, problematic when it comes to thinner plant stands, we have seen instances where guys are able to up their yield pretty significantly compared to planting, you know, the 20th of May and and uh, waiting to that window, right? Um, so, so should it be planted first? Uh, yeah, Dave, absolutely. I'm going to be uh, strong today. Plant because I don't care about corn. 
right? I mean, I couldn't care That's less right. if you're corn, Who cares? corn that doesn't turn yeah. out. So absolutely, That's plant right. your soybeans first. Let's go for it and get the job done. Yeah, that's right. You're the soybean specialist. We don't care about corn. All right. Now, Yvonne, last year presented an so similar question. What about soybeans before canola? So, yes, we grow corn in Manitoba, but realistically, these are sometimes the crops that we're trying to balance off on, on a window. And last year, we did see canola go in after beans, um, which was, you know, not the norm. But should it be the norm? Are we pushing? Are we moving that way? You know, I saw an interesting article this winter about, you know, flea beetles and canola and that driving people to push soy, uh, flea beetles later. And I wonder, you know, if you're worried about flea beetles, if you would plant your soybeans ahead of corn. Uh, work by uh, Cassandra Kochik that we did for her master's thesis uh, showed in Manitoba that earliest the earliest planting date for soybeans was our highest yielding treatment. So in Manitoba, we need every day we can get. Um, mm -hmm. and so you might want to plant your soybeans early. Now we got to always balance that with our frost risk. So that's always the game that you're playing in Manitoba is trying to get as much growing season as you can and balancing that with your risk of frost. It'll be interesting to see this year what happens as people now try and balance that risk of reseeding canola due to flea beetles with mm -hmm. the risk of frost damage to soybeans this year. Mm -hmm. You know, um, We've done a lot of work rotationally with soybeans and corn uh, with, you know, the diversity of crops like canola uh, and spring wheat in Manitoba. And there, I think there's a lot of flexibility with where soybeans fall into rotation. I think mm -hmm. soybeans and corn are both very highly mycorrhizal plants. And so anytime you're following a mycorrhizal plant like soybeans or corn after canola, you see a delay um and plant development and potentially more oh. phosphorus deficiency and so um the work that we've done looking at mycorrhizae and plant roots shows that you know in the end once these plants get to the reproductive phase the mycorrhizae catch up but early in the season you're going to see some delay following canola um i've seen mm -hmm. it more in corn than with soybeans but um but you can expect those plants to respond and as soils warm up and as the mycorrhizae get to um, to infect uh, and catch up after canola, then then they'll catch up. But you might see you might not be happy with how it looks early in the season. But we haven't seen many yield differences later on. Mm, that is one thing I would I will give beans this because horse they're not my favorite crop. I'll just admit it now. Um, but you can have some pretty rough looking early growth and be pleasantly surprised. Like they are, they they are quite surprising at times. So I will give them that, um, absolutely. Now Scott brings up an important point. If we're going to talk about, which we're maybe not talking about residue management so well, but this plays hand in hand of cold water imbibition. So this is of course that first drink of water that that seed takes in. If it is icy cold, I don't care if it's April twentieth or May thirty first. That's all bad, right, Horst? Well, you know, uh, here's the problem. Academically, in the lab, absolutely true. In the field, pretty much irrelevant. Um, you know, I've planted soybeans at minus two degrees Celsius. We've planted soybeans when the following night went to minus six degrees Celsius, and they yielded 70 bushels, right? I mean, it, it just they are pretty tough now to your point about that initial number of hours yes those are important right and if you uh, the situations i'm talking about are planting into dry conditions dry 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 so you know as i'm updating the agronomy guide for the next time around i'm taking out any conversation about temperature it's that's old agronomy i just don't think it matters other than this cold rain or if the temperature stays cold like i don't want anybody to misunderstand soybeans are a subtropical species they want it warm it's not that they don't mm -hmm. you know uh love heat practically though the issue is that because we can stand uh, a few uh we can withstand a lower population right we do lose some plants but because mm -hmm. we overseed anyway and since planting data is so important We've just discovered that 
if the soil is dry, you plant, right? And and that's the long and the short of it. Now, would I plant if it's, you know, like I said, two degrees and there's snow in the forecast or it's supposed to be freezing rain or something? No, I mean, we got to use some common sense here, right? I mean, we haven't, we haven't uh, completely, you know, you could make, I, I'm going to try though. This just, this will think, this will make you think I've lost my mind completely. But uh, I'm hoping to hook up my tractor next week. And as soon as, as soon as I can get no. out there, I'm going to plant some soybeans. Um, and let's see oh what my happens. Gosh. Why not? Oh my Give God. her. Ultra right. early Good. soybeans. You heard it yeah, from ultra, horse. Yeah, ultra early beans. Look out. All right. I, best I think of luck this to you. temperature talk is exactly where we get to the residue management piece because yeah, that it is. is the big fear. If we've okay, got residue, so, it's going to be cold and wet, and I can't plant okay. my soybeans, and Ex they're going to be terrible. Yes, they are. And so we actually have some slides because, and this is these are one of the ones that I found absolutely fascinating because that's exactly it, right? I need black dirt because it's going to warm up fast, and that's what I have to have because it has to be hot. I need warm soil. Okay, so which, hang on, which slide was it? Oh, goodness. Now I don't know if I wrote it down. Jade, it's, yeah, it's the soil temp and tillage slide. That might not be Maybe enough. slide I'm six. Sorry, it might be slide six. I think that okay. is, like, if we talk about Manitoba, that yeah. is the context for residue management decisions with these long season crops like beans and corn, right? Um, as we're moving these soil or these crops west and into shorter growing season areas where we got to plant earlier and hope that we don't get an early frost to mature them uh the concern is that you know residue management is gonna and and using soil conservation is gonna cost you uh yeah. come harvest time and so that's one of the first things i wanted to look at when i was starting to work with soybeans in manitoba is you know what residue management practices are actually compatible with having successful soybean crops. So this is a project where we were looking at corn residue management. So what are all the different tools in the toolbox for um, slicing and dicing corn residue? And what are their impacts uh, on soil temperature and moisture? And this is the master's work of, um, of Patrick Walter and the great work that he did on farm in Manitoba. So these are soil temperatures that we measured in real farmers fields in Manitoba where we practice, we used vertical tillage, both, you know, set to do high disturbance and low disturbance, compared it to the standard practices of multiple passes with a disc. And then we compared it to, you know, the best of both world treatment, strip till, where we did lots of tillage in the row, and then we have very little tillage in between the rows. So we can see our, you know, that bottom line, that dark blue line, very low soil temperatures in between the rows of strip till as we would expect. But if we look for, you know, that check treatment, our disc treatment, the green line there, it's right there kind of hanging out near the orange line, which is vertical till high disturbance. And then we've got vertical till low disturbance, not too far down uh, below with that peachy line. And then our strip till in row, which is, let's face it, the most intensive tillage treatment concentrated in a small area comes up right on top there. So we've got um, soil temperature over a day, you can see it swing from cold around six in the morning to peak around three o'clock in the afternoon. So this is just before we were going out to plant soybeans uh, in 2015 in Winkler. So we can mm -hmm. see that it does make a difference, but you know, it's not as big of a difference as we thought, especially when we compare sort of the low disturbance vertical till treatment and the high disturbance vertical treatment. So I think even with our tillage tools, there's lots of room there to leave some residue on the surface to minimize uh, erosion and keep that soil in place over winter time. Mm -hmm. And there's I a mean, lot of reason to consider a practice like strip till if you want the, yeah. you know, the, the soil warming benefit of tillage and also to keep that residue in place in between the rows later in the growing season. So Yvonne, well, if I could ask a question here, do you, do you remember at the, um, off the top of your head when the tillage was done for these? I don't see that. I'm just wondering if that has some impact, you know, because sometimes we do tillage and then we can't plant for two weeks because uh, yeah. the conditions are such. Yeah, so for these experiments, we did uh, tillage. When did we do the tillage? We did the tillage in the fall ahead of the planting. Uh, 
for some of the experiments that I have data that I'm going to show today, there we did tillage in the springtime ahead of planting. So in Manitoba, especially, you know, in the Red River Valley where we have heavy clay soils, we would prefer, if possible, to do this tillage in the fall. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not possible, or if you're on lighter, sandier soils, you might choose to do this tillage in the springtime to try and leave as much residue in, po in place as possible over the winter time and through you know, we've got a lot of erosion happening in Manitoba um, when the snow melts. And then we've got sort of an open open period for April, uh, maybe even late March. We can have a lot of wind then and we can see a lot of soil blowing at that time. Horace, how different does that sound than sort of the typical for Ontario? Well, we're worried about the temperature, of course, right in the row. So there's no question that if you push the residue away from the row that you're seeding, right, we'll have similar numbers to this where it's it's warmer in, in that zone for sure. And so I think that that is part of the reason why we are seeing some benefits in terms of plant stands in uh, tilled fields right it's not just seed placement it's not just the fact that we're pushing the residue um out of the way in terms of, of us um, getting that drill or planter to work better but there are some improved plant stands like in our vertical tillage work we, we do pick up up to ten thousand more plants per acre when we use that system compared to a straight no-till drill in heavy corn mm -hmm. residue. So I, I, what I'm trying to say is I think that this, this issue of soil temperature is, is uh, part of the reason why we're picking up a few more plants per acre because some of them do suffer. The, the amazing part about soybeans is to what you hinted at before, uh, they can look pretty tough. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter in terms of yield. Mm -hmm. So even though I just said the 10,000 plants per acre, to be honest, that doesn't change yield, right? So there you go. It might it might make you feel better though. Like it looks better. <laughs> I guess it's a it's a it's a sort of risk management type thing, right? Is that if it looks good, you hope it's good. If it looks rough, you stress about it. So so maybe it's we just need to stress less when it looks bad and just be thankful when it looks good, uh, potentially. Okay, we're going to just quickly, uh, before we move to our next segment, I am going to pull, uh, this is a quick clip uh, from one of our uh, soybean schools just recently with Sean Conley um, from the University of Wisconsin talking about as we try to decrease tillage and try to pull some tillage out of rotation, what do we have to consider uh, for our soybeans? Jay, if you can run the clip. Now I'm putting up on the screen now the results from the first year and uh, your treatments across the board. And hey, let, let's dig into the results. You know, moving left or right, the first thing I notice is that, you know, straight no-till really works better with a, a spring nitrogen application. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised by that, and I don't know why, because, you know, if we look back in our books, we do have an old recommendation in A2809, that's our soil fertility handbook for the state of Wisconsin, showing a two-by-two -two placement of up to 30 pounds of N in a, in, in a no-till situation. So, again, we have some historical data to, to really look at that. So, what I think we're seeing there is maybe with these heavy uh, residue situations, that some of that early season nitrogen is being tied up um, in that corn residue. So by applying a little bit of nitrogen, again, if you see on there, we didn't go any more than 30 pounds of N. Uh, the reason for that is because we don't want to mess up biological N fixation. So if you put too much nitrogen out there, what that does is it inhibits those, you know, the rhizobia from forming. Mm -hmm. So about 30 pounds is all you want to put out there. If you go above that, then you can really mess, mess that system up and, you know, Soybean is a big nitrogen pig, and we need the, those biological end fixers out there fixing that nitrogen. So yeah, that's what we kind of saw out there is that that 30 pounds really helped us overcome that some of those early season challenges and that yield challenge we've seen in our no-till systems. Mm. Now the data indicates that you know removing residue, you know spring and fall, actually reduces yield. Um, are you surprised by that? You know what's happening there? Yeah, it's a good question, and we kind of. How about I don't know, Bern? How about how about that? You know, as a as a scientist, we have to really kind of say what we what the data supports and what we don't know. And and again, I just want to 
also suggest, Brenda, this is only one year. Mm. You know, we're still digging into this. I, I don't want to put too much weight on just one yep. year data, but I think there's some interesting things that maybe farmers can at least try and, mm. and, and think about. So again, we don't go back to black dirt. I don't right. I don't like to see black dirt on the landscape. It's not good for water quality. It's not good for carbon sequestration. So I, I'm really just trying to push farmers to maybe think outside the box and really trying to keep that residue on that mm. field. And, and that's what year two of trial data is for as well, right? That's right. Now, Sean, you have some strong results, you know, when chopping residue in the spring and the fall. And, and you know, really, yields really do pop, you know, when you add spring nitrogen. Right. And, and I'm, again, I'm kind of I'm pleasantly surprised by, by, by those results because we really were trying to, again, get at what is the mechanism? Why are we seeing this yield <clears throat> decrease? With these heavy residue systems and you know initially burn we thought it was soil temperature or soil moisture and then we when we look at the data we don't see that as the driver and um another thing that we've done we've gone in we pulled some soil samples and some of the data i haven't really dug into yet is you know what how much of that nitrogen is available within that soil profile so we have some of that we also pulled some soil samples where it looks at some microbial activity to see if there's <clears throat> some soil health factors that might be involved with with what's going on out there. So again, this that data slide that we just looked at there, that's kind of just the tip tip of the iceberg, and we're really trying to get at the mechanism. That's kind of the interesting, the sciency part of this yeah. stuff. Thank you to our sponsors for the agronomists, Adama Canada, Soybean School, and FMC Preschool. FMC Preschool is an education and stewardship extension of FMC Canada with a firm mandate to educate and bring value to customers and stakeholders regarding proactive weed control and resistance management best practices. For product agnostic weed management content, visit www.fmcpreschool.com. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. Oh, looks like I'm frozen. So that's exciting. Oh, there we go. Okay. All I took from that is nitro or soybeans are nitrogen pig. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, although, sort of. Anyway, John, I am also not ignoring your questions. John has a couple of good questions there. Um, and I will get to them in a moment. But I did want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about this idea of exactly that. What about nitrogen tie up in really high residue situations? And does adding nitrogen help? So Horst, do we have an Ontario experience that can inform this whole idea of adding N in the spring? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've been working on adding a little bit of nitrogen to soybeans for 20 years, right? It's certainly the kind of thing that has been done all around the world because as we know, soybeans are such a big, big nitrogen user. And, and so of course, any, anybody can throw on some nitrogen. It's not hard to do. The fundamental problem is, um, you know, the fact that the yield response is extremely variable. So that's the first thing, right? Uh, you gotta, you gotta be really careful with some of those numbers. So if you, if you put up my slides for a second and you go right to um, slide number eight, actually, okay. um, there's a nice picture there of where we put on nitrogen and, of course, straight no-till on the other side. And it doesn't always happen, right, that you get this faster canopy closure, this kind of vigorous growth. Um, but here's kind of the cool part, which, you know, it was really interesting to hear Sean there. And he he basically is showing a three bushel uh, type of response to added nitrogen in the spring. Right. Um, if you think back to those charts and the impact to tillage is also in that um, ballpark, a little bit more, but not a lot more. So if you go to the next slide. We, from the last couple of years, you know, we've been trying to answer this sulfur question, but interestingly enough, where we put down um, 50 pounds of urea, right? Um, so that's obviously just 20, 21 pounds of actual N. 
uh, we're getting 2.3 bushels, right? And most of those are in a min-till situation where there's still corn stalks. Some are true no-till, actually. Um, and so we're actually picking up. Uh, this is the fascinating part, you know. When we look at our tillage, our pre-till yield response, it's the exact kind of number. So I think we're addressing the same problem. It's that early season nitrogen tie up. And, um, you know, what I'm trying to get at is we need to do some experiments where we do a little bit of tillage plus add on nitrogen. I'm just starting to play with that to see if the number is still two or three bushels, right? Um, because it's not going to be four or five. I can pretty much guarantee you that. But it'd be really interesting to know if nitrogen can take the place of a little bit of pre-tillage, right? Because that's what Sean is essentially saying. He's saying, hey, listen, we've got choices. You can do a little bit of tillage or you can put on a little bit of nitrogen. And uh, that's that's an interesting thought process, right? Um, and, and I guess at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, you know, these numbers of a few bushels to a little bit of nitrogen are, are real. I mean, we are picking them up. So yeah. this also, so that does bring it into, that's great context for us, because it does bring it into the the cost benefit sort of discussion, right? So there's obviously more costs to running across the fields um, to do a passive tillage than just fuel, because there's all sorts of other, I mean, there's equipment costs, whatever, but we have to drive across the field to add nitrogen, or we're going to drive across the field to do tillage. So with the cost of nitrogen, which one's more pricey? Which one, I guess, driving or putting nitrogen on might be easier if you don't have the tillage equipment, but it's still a cost either way. So is it economical, that extra couple bushels is my question. Yeah, and that's the, the crux of the problem, isn't it? Next mm -hmm. question. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm able to do some nitrogen accounting work. Now, this was under conventional tillage systems in Manitoba. And we did the nitrogen accounting, looking at, you know, if you add fertilizer to soybeans, what's going on with nitrogen fixation, and then looking at total yield. And we found wherever we, you know, added nitrogen, we're just reducing nitrogen fixation. And so, mm -hmm. you know, my thought in our current nitrogen pricing and the need to conserve soil carbon why are we not pushing these soybeans you know they can fix nitrogen let's put those soybeans where we don't have nitrogen and get them to work for us because those other nitrogen responsive crops you know like cereals or corn that's where we can really get the best benefit from that nitrogen that we're going to apply i think soybeans we got to change our mentality there and start thinking about how can we get nitrogen fixation working most efficiently for us and I guess that's where we need some plant breeders to join this conversation as well. And get us get us some some varieties and some bacteria that work together even better than what we have. Even better what um, we got now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, well, so that is it is a good point though. And you know, other than let's say rescue treatments or those sorts of things, is that I guess it depends what the goal is, but I can certainly understand where after let's say a very large corn crop where you have a lot of residue, I mean, the it can look rather daunting to try and get a crop up and out of the ground in a, a min-till or zero-till situation. And so the idea of can we sort of help the plants along or maybe help the processes along to get them up and out of the ground and, and going, but ultimately it's still economics because as seems to be a recurring theme, even when they don't look great, they can do well. So yes. I'm just there saying. Too, we've got nitrogen oh, as one tool to help, you know, yep. move those soybeans along early in the season. But what is that costing you later on in the season yep. when, you know, you don't have that pool of rhizobia and those roots to draw on? Um, we want to set that crop up for August when they need to pull all that nitrogen compared to early in the season. Um, when I think about, you know, the context for this in Manitoba, we also did some work looking at wheat stubble and uh, and how we can look at different residue management options for wheat ahead of soybeans, which is really common in our rotations with spring wheat. And mm -hmm. there too, like we've got lots of options, just like with corn residue management, where we can, you know, find a midway point, whether it's strip till or yeah. vertical tillage, where we're leaving some of that residue on the surface. 
even with wheat residue management, we found options in Manitoba, and I don't know if we can go to what slide would that be here? We can look at some of these different treatments. Um, sorry, here. Uh, going to slide 10. Around. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so slide 10 there shows, uh, you know, some of the contrasting uh, wheat stubble treatments we created ahead of soybean, where we, you know, have our, you know, common double disking treatment compared to both short stubble and tall stubble. And then we compared that, of course, to strip tillage again. And one of the most interesting treatments out of this project, which is Greg Bartley's master's thesis work, um, was the tall stubble treatment. And, you know, this was the tallest stubble we could cut at the research farm. These were treatments that we were creating. Um, we did the stubble height ones in spring, and then we did the strip till in treatment. And what we found with that tall stubble treatment, and maybe that tall stubble was about 40 centimeters tall at best. So it wasn't anything near uh, stripper header height, right, uh, yeah. was that where we had that straw standing, uh, instead of cutting it short and having it create a mat on the ground, we had warmer soil temperatures because we had less of that residue as a mat on the ground. So I think there's a lot of creativity there we can use to find this sweet spot, even with some crops that can produce a lot of residue like wheat and like corn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, Horst, you wanted to jump in there before, so I'll go back to you now. Well, I mean, I guess when I, if I have to kind of summarize where my head is at with respect to this residue issue and tillage, let's word it that way. The mm -hmm. issue is not about, um, you know, uh, incorporating the residue. It's not even about breaking it down. It's not about deep tillage. It's not about soil temperature in any big way or moisture. What the real problem is, is that residue right up in the row, it retards early season growth. And that's because of nitrogen tie up and a bunch of other factors, right? So push that garbage out of the way, right? With a good row unit planter or some sort of a row cleaner or some growers have have actually used a toolbar to push it back into the row and then just plant into that, you know, stale seed bed or whatever you want to call it. You've got the residue out of the way, but you haven't really done any tillage. And you know what? That works very well for soybeans. And so we have to get away from this idea of um, chopping the corn stalks and then taking a, a no-till drill and driving across that on an angle because we want to try and level out the field. And that's the worst case scenario as far as I'm concerned with respect to this residue conversation after corn. Um, and, and yeah, to, to your point, uh, Yvonne, about leaving the, the corn stalks up, uh, that is a good strategy. If you're going to be a true no-tiller, just leave the corn stalks as high as you can and then travel down the row and be done with it uh, and get that those beans established off the corn row. And yeah, we, yep. we have pretty good success with that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, just briefly, so Kevin and Scott have made a point and I want to make it clear Yes, we are focused on residue management ahead of beans, but we can totally take your questions about residue management of soybeans. But the snide comment in me is, what are you worried about? It's soybeans. They hardly leave anything behind. Um, so, Kevin or Scott, if you've got questions about managing the residue left by soybean crop by all means ask uh, we can ask those as well um, or we can we can discuss those as well for sure so um two two things that came up and jason's got a good question here but john asked earlier about so horst you're gonna go out next week and do ultra early seeding like ultra ultra early planting seeding i, I said i was gonna hook the, i said i was gonna hook the tractor up it's, it's, it's are a, you? Yeah. remember i'm yeah. a government guy it takes us a month to hook it up the tractor right that's Give me true. okay okay so we're talking like march 10th to 12th okay sounds the good first uh, we'll window. check it the first yeah the window. first okay that thank you for clarifying your right government okay uh the speed of government <laughs> but john's question though is what about ultra low populations so this is one yvonne probably hears far too often because with canola um very tiny seed we we kill a whole bunch of them when we plant them or seed them um and seed gets expensive so then we try to 
to singulate and get, you know, each one of them to grow. Have we seen, Horst, what does the work tell us about what we can do with populations? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating conversation, actually, because you can get soybeans to um, respond very nicely to a bunch of inputs, including nitrogen, a two by two band of fertilizer of P and K, even to maybe a foliar fungicide and other tillage work uh, in low population, low populations, right? Because each plant then need, it has, has more need to bush and fill in. And so if you want to show big responses, right, to any, any uh, input you're putting on, do it in 30-inch rows with low populations, and you'll be amazed at the responses you get. And we've done that. You can get five, eight bushels, no problem to some of this stuff. The problem is then if you compare that to a narrow row and you do nothing, you get the same yield. And of course, in the narrow role, we've got a higher seeding rate to try and answer the question. It's essentially the same thing. So uh, personally, I believe eventually we will plant precisely with soybeans in a little bit of a wider row scenario, and we'll learn to feed that plant so that it can really put on all the pods it wants. We're going to stop treating it like alfalfa and we're going to treat it more like corn. The problem is, you know, soybeans are a funny beast that way that they just seem to do well if you have a nice thick stand, right? But mm. all that to say is we are trying to uh, redo some of our seeding rate recommendations. And on the whole, we're finding with these new genetics and some of the, the ways that we're doing a better job with some of this residue management, more planters out there, and that kind of thing that we can seed a little bit less and and get the same yield right so i think we are moving to a lower seeding rate uh, scenario yvonne do you see a, a pretty wide range of populations that go in my brain's a little foggy on seeding rates right now i know we did work on seeding rates looking at uh late planting because that was more unknown in Manitoba when we were doing this work in 2015 and 16. And for sure, the later that we planted, the higher populations paid off. But to give you a number, I'd have to go dig through my notes. Yeah. That's, that's all right. We only have an hour. So that's not going right. to work. Um, now, so, so John's, so John's, and that's okay. John's point here, he saw a video somewhere of like uh, ultra low populations putting like 250 pods per plant. But that's exactly what you're saying, Horst, is that at low populations, one plant will do amazing things. The question is, is that enough to make up for all of its friends not being there? And realistically only you can make yeah, it so, yeah so the answer is absolutely not we're doing those trials you, you get between yeah. three and six bushels less per acre and you can make that up again if you really feed those beans so congratulations you've come back to zero right i mean that's the problem yeah. you, you yeah. you've you yeah they look awesome and i can show you pictures that'll you know you'll say well i want that bean yeah absolutely it's got lots of pods that's the one i want the problem is uh, as soon as I have a decent population, they don't look like that anymore, right? And so right. that is one of the things we're trying to address. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. So we do have a plant breeder who has hopped on. Um, and, oh, no, we don't. Uh, uh, wait, wait. Not, this is this, bad news. Not sure about breeding soybeans to ignore soil and nitrogen. So, oh, Yvonne, you're going to have to tailor your ask a bit better. Um, and see if you can get them on side. Uh, okay, and then of course Danielle brings up, is that enough to keep the nasty weeds at bay? So this is this is the other thing, and this is what I love about the show, and I absolutely adore each and every one of you um, who hop on here, is that, n that none of these things happen in isolation, right? And when we change one thing, there's a cascade of impacts down the road. So if we change our row spacing, or we change our populations, or we change our um, our planting dates, we potentially impact our weed populations to the good, to the bad, all of those sorts of things. So, so great, great statement, of course, is we want, we need competition as well. We need a competitive crop to outcompete the weeds, right? 
Absolutely. Horace, do you want to start with that one? Oh, no, that's uh, absolutely part of the whole strategy of having a nice thick crop early on and narrow rows, right? I know growers that went to 15s from seven and a halfs, and they said even that requires one more application of a herbicide, never mind the guys that go to 30 inch rows, right? To your point that then you, the canopy takes maybe as much as a week to 10 days longer to close. So no question, we want a thick, full canopy as soon as possible with respect to weed control. Mm -hmm. I appear to be frozen. Yvonne, do you have anything to add on that one? We're gonna, before we uh, switch gears, because I want to switch gears into one last topic before we run out of time, because time is rapidly Let's getting Let's go there. Um, yeah, right. All right. We're going to do, uh, we're going to do one last thank you to our sponsors and then we're going to shift gears just a little uh, to close out the show. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool, and the Soybean School. The Soybean School on Real Agriculture is an agronomy and issues video series that allows soybean growers to learn on their own time and at their own pace in order to become better growers in the long term. The Soybean School is made possible by support from BASF, Syngenta Canada, and Pride Seeds. Find out more at soybeanschool.com. Just, I'm just going to sit here and groove. All right, this is so much fun. We are having so fantastic questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are uh, into our last bit of the show here. So please, if you've got some questions for our guests, uh, ask them now. Ask early, ask often. I do want to talk about uh, fall rise. So, and and that weed question sort of uh, reminded me, of course. So, so we have been, especially recently, had with the herbicide management and um, a whole bunch of different discussions. We've, of course, been having this discussion of the role of fall rye and, uh, of course, the impact on the following crop. Um, and so I wanted to tackle this from, from a few different perspectives. But, Yvonne, you've actually got some really cool uh, slides here. Where are we? I think it's slides 15 and 16, slide Jay. 50. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start there and look at what we know. So on, in the from these trials. residue so is, uh, management cool. experiment that we did, one of the far out treatments that we did back in 2015 was to look at fall rye. And it was it didn't perform as well as our other, you know, wheat residue management treatments. And that really got me curious, especially with the work that we were seeing happening in North Dakota with um, green seeding fall rye on heavy clay soils. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a really, coming back to our original discussion about what what could we what do we want um, and what are some of the reasons why we do a lot of tillage and that i think is to you know make soil dry in the springtime and to make soil warm so what if we could get water out of the soil a different way what if we could transpire water out of the soil instead of you know using tillage to evaporate water out of the soil so of course that means we need to do some agronomy work so um, my current student virginia jansen's been looking at different termination timings for fall rye. And we did this work with and without strip tillage. Now, you know, as soon as you set up a project that would be optimized in really wet conditions, what happens? It's super dry for three years. So these, yes. <laughs> these experiments happened in two really dry years. And so we learned a lot about, you know, the benefit of mulch uh, for uh, conserving soil moisture instead of how rye can help transpire water out of soils. And in that scenario, the strip tail didn't play out as importantly in this experiment because it just, you know, hastened drying from the soil. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I think fall rye is a great uh, cover crop to pair with soybeans. Again, I want to push those soybeans to fix nitrogen. I'm not afraid of, you know, putting some nitrogen into this fall rye in the springtime to give you some trafficability um, to help protect those soils in the springtime because, you know, that soybean's gonna sense low nitrogen and start fixing nitrogen uh, for, with rhizobia. Now, for those of you watching from Ontario, you're probably gonna look at my fall rye treatment pictures here and, you know, guffaw, because this is mm. really, you know, low amounts of fall rye biomass in the springtime, but this is what we can grow in Manitoba when we're trying to plant 
soybeans early in May. We, we don't have a lot of rye residue. And so I don't think we really need to be afraid of it. Now, we had a scenario this spring where it was wet. And this might be where you get a little bit of shy about fall rye residue because it, we couldn't get in. Or our priorities were such that instead of going and terminating the fall rye, um, we were out seeding. And so I think those trade-offs are very real and I'm not gonna sugarcoat this system. But I think that there, for, in terms of risk management strategies for wet versus dry springs, this is something that producers in Manitoba should be thinking about. If we go to the next slide, slide 17, you can take a look at some of the soybean yields that we saw after uh, after these contrasting termination dates. So we terminated uh, the fall rye based on our target planting date for soybeans. So we targeted, we terminated uh, the fall rye 14 days before we planted soybeans, four days, one day after. So, you know, you plant green and then spray it out and then 14 days after. So that was the worst case scenario. What if you couldn't get in? How bad is it going to be? And we can see that it is bad numerically um, in these dry soybean years where we did these experiments, uh, 2019, 2020 uh, in Carmen and Morris. And, uh, but, you know, we had a wide window in these, uh, for these experiments, in these dry years with pretty moderate rye growth. Will these hold up to really wet springs uh, when we have a lot of fall rye growth or would it hold up in Ontario, that's that's what I've got to punt back to horse there. There you go. Um, but fascinating. I, I do hope that you've continued them because you've certainly had wet years now and uh, we'll see what 2023 20, brings. But Horst, what do we see in the Ontario scenario um, with similar setups? Well, I mean, I think we have a pretty good understanding that we want to kill that uh, rye early, right? 14 days ahead of time is um, is a good thing to do. Like, it, the real issue is, of course, how thick it is, um, mm -hmm. which I, I'm not sure how you tried to address that question in, in this work, because um, one of the things I've, I've observed is that w with many cover crops is – it all comes down to the plant density. Like we can live very nicely with a relatively thin cover crop, even if it ends up that we have to spray a little bit later, or even dare I say it, you know, after planting, it's these thick cover crops that cause us a lot of grief, right? If you can't spray them off. And so um, my take on it is you want to spray that stuff off soon. And, um, you know, I've done some planting into crimped rye and all that kind of stuff. And boy, if the weather turns dry after, you can you can take some pretty significant yield losses with that, right? And so I, I, I do think that there is something to be said about um, that old adage in weed control. In other words, uh, it's the weeds that are there um, and emerging at the same time as the soybeans, right? So, you know, how do, how do you translate that over to some of these cover crop stories? Um, we forget our basic weed control kind of um, knowledge. And so, yeah, it's a challenge for sure. But I, like I say, I think the big thing comes down to how thick is that crop. I, I, I believe in cover crops, but I also think we're putting them on way too thick in a lot of cases. Depends on what you I want to use. Real, yeah. Good question. Go ahead. You know, in the prairie context, you know, where we're not growing a lot of cover crop biomass, how much is enough? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that picture on that slide there had, um, you know, some beans in the foreground that were much smaller and delayed compared to the beans in the background there where we had our latest termination treatment 14 days after planting. That was our carbon 2019 or carbon 2019 um, okay. site year. So you can see there numerically, definitely a hit. Um, but, you know, yeah. statistically with the variability, we didn't see a yield decline. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, soybeans, it's the long game, especially on the prairies. Um, 
are you going to have moisture to fill pots in in August? And um, mm -hmm. the early season moisture deficit that we might have from a small or a moderate uh, rye biomass can really be outweighed by having that residue later on or helping keep soil pores open later on so that when you get rainfall, that water can move it into the it. soil yeah. and and be there to be taken up later on in August. Mm -hmm. Which again, Horst is like, eh, we're good. Um, so, <laughs> but well, yes, we're now Dave, it rains. I mean, just to be if clear, it rains, I mean, yeah. Yeah. like, I mean, we're cooked, we're cooked if it doesn't rain, whether you have residue yeah. there or not, As well. like, that's the, yeah. that's the real issue I was trying to get at. Yes. And, uh, but I think, well, the statistics will play out, but typically we get some good rain in August. It's, right. it's not right. Like it's on average we do so we don't worry about it as much but so dr dave hooker does bring up uh the other point i wanted to bring up of course which plays into last week's episode which was about herbicide resistant weed management um and the other benefit of course to a fall rye crop is is just the incredible incredible impact it can have on fleabane and fleabane mm -hmm. of course and soybeans can just take over in no time at all so um there is just you know a time and a place, right? And recognizing what the trade-offs might be. Um, and what is your bigger issue? So um, yes, you might run the risk potentially of, of maybe not being able to terminate it when you want, which um, we will be tackling in an upcoming episode as well. Uh, but if flea bane is your problem, then fall rye could be a really great solution. So um, it all depends on really what's in front of you for sure. Uh, now back to, so John, I did promise, and Jason's also asked a, a question about cover crops. So maybe I'll start with that first uh, because we're sort of with, you know, fall rye as a cover crop. But Jason did ask, so if we want soybean crops to scavenge that end, and not necessarily scavenge, we want them to build those symbiotic relationships with the bacteria and, and, and make their own end. Um, is there a benefit to having a cover crop that, that does fix them in and provides it to the following soybean crop was his question or do we really not really care about such a thing because it'll fix its own anyway well fundamentally they're different um bacterium that invade the the different species of crops right they're not all the same so from that perspective, I don't think we have any evidence that if you have a cover crop that has nodules, for instance, that, that your subsequent crop of soybeans will have more nodules. At least I'm not aware of anything like that. No, but, um, but the end that it fixes potentially is available for the soybean crop that follows. But it's Okay, now well, let's start. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, that, that whole thing about cover crops fixing nitrogen for the subsequent crop. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. There's not enough there to talk about. That is a, that's a good story. The cover crop people tell us, but that it doesn't work out like that in real life because they use their, the, the, the nitrogen. And I'm telling you, if you, if you think you can reduce uh, the amount of nitrogen you put on, right, because of some cover crop, I just don't think that there's a lot to that. I mean, we, we know if, of course, if it's an alfalfa crop and all those kind of things, but that has more to do with the fact that there's no corn residue than the fact that, that there's extra nitrogen. Like we could debate about whether we're actually able to fix enough nitrogen in the in the previous crop to affect the following crop it's a long-term thing like to, to build organic matter and to take nitrogen out of the air uh and and to really do that whole process that takes ten thousand years i mean you know we talk about cover crops changing things in one year i just don't buy it uh, usually usually our problem with cover crops is that they're a nuisance and they cause us a lot of problems and we try to negate all those problems but anyway you can tell cover crops is not my favorite subject you said beans <laughs> weren't your favorite so, so i'm giving it back yeah, to you you, you can you can because i love cover crops because my sheep eat them so but okay. it is an important distinction between a perennial nitrogen fixer like alfalfa is a heck of a lot different conversation than say putting down some clover in the fall that maybe has a limited amount of time to grow and then that breaks down the next year so i know yeah, and, and that's why i did throw out yeah 
you're yeah. so right. I did. I did give you that little bit of room for alfalfa there. I, yeah, thank I think you. That, I really appreciate that's it. All, that's yeah. all I'm giving you to that. That's it. That's yeah, all I'm giving you to, to talk yeah. about. You know what cover crops are offering. Like we're talking about yeah. breaking down residue, right? And so yeah. the fall cover crop, whether it fixes nitrogen or whether it doesn't fix nitrogen, you're putting some low C to N biomass into the into that soil system at a time of year where those microbes aren't used to being fed. Yeah. And fed. so yeah. whether you are feeding them with a high end legume or a really young, luscious, you know, cereal crop, you're going to be feeding those microbes and giving them some nitrogen to help break down that big pile of residue that you just incorporated um, with that harvest of the subsequent crop. So I think that's one thing. Um, one role that they do play. I like coming back to the question about like, do we want to put a nitrogen fixing crop ahead of a another nitrogen, nitrogen fixing, fixing crop like soybean? Yeah. I think that's a mismatch of goals. I think the goal that I have for a low residue crop like soybean is to get some residue there because we're not going to have any residue when that soybean crop comes off. And and that's where we really maybe can transition into this topic of residue management after soybeans. My biggest problem with soybeans is that there's not enough of it. And we see soil blowing, yeah. even in no-till mm -hmm. fields after soybeans and other low residue legumes um, mm -hmm. on the in the prairies. And so my biggest goal is to either have a cereal crop growing ahead, you leave, you plan for that residue to be there ahead of time, or, you know, mm -hmm. rye as a cover crop is an option for growing some of that residue ahead of that low residue soybean crop that's going to follow. So horse, like similar idea, if, if you're going to put soybeans in between corn rows, you're still going to have corn stock there in that fall still. There'll be some. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, are we worried about that? No, no, we're not worried about that. I mean, I, I, in, in, in our scenario, right, I think the big thing is, of course, the soybean trash can be a problem for the winter wheat that's planted immediately after if it's not spread evenly. And that's kind of an equipment type of, of conversation. But that's really where um, the only thing we're talking about with respect to problems associated with, with soybean residue that I can think of. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think you're right, Yvonne, that the big thing is, you know, what do we do after soybeans? And, and we have some growers here because, of course, you know, the weather's often nicer then um, because their beans come off before corn, obviously. Uh, and then they do some tillage and, and for no real reason. And that is that is a problem, right? We don't need to see that. We should be thinking about establishing a cover crop after soybeans, not tillage. Um, and a lot of us are getting there. I think that we have come a yeah. long way in the last uh, number of years to try and to try and keep the soil where it is, right? So, I mean, I just wanna, I always like to backpedal. You know me, Lindsay, I'm, <laughs> I'm this government guy. I make a big statement and then I backpedal. And then you backpedal. <laughs> no, yeah. but to Yvonne's point, it's about what are your goals? What are, what are we offering? I mean, we can't, cover crops have, they can do wonderful things and fit all sorts of roles, but they can't do everything. And we can't turn them into, you know, a silver bullet for every problem. Um, but I'm just glad that I have you on the record saying that we don't need to work soybean stubble. Please, everyone, oh, stop yeah. working your soybean stubble. You don't need to. All right. Um, and where's Wheat Pete? Wheat Pete, Scott, great question. Pete will be back in a couple of weeks. He has... Um, community theater on monday nights and so he cannot be here live uh he watches the show sometimes after if i tell him to um anyway we are all out of time and i really appreciate it uh ray thank you so much you're right great conversation spinning of variables which i like and uh, maybe a friendly bar fight which every good discussion needs okay um no this has been so much fun horse thank you so much much uh yvonne thank you for joining me on the show for the very first time i appreciate it i hope you'll be back um and as mentioned uh this is the 99th episode next week uh will be our 100th and we are talking flea beetles and i do promise we do have a spring management of cover crop residue topic coming up in a few weeks so i'll keep you posted horst thank you so much thank you it's been fun yes thanks yvonne yep see you again yep thanks yvonne. all right and Take thank care. you to to all our sponsors as well uh, for making this evening possible. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next week, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here. Cheers, everybody.